Welcome to the pre-lecture for Industrial Ecology, Fall 2018, Week 8. I am Joshua Scove. Eco-labels this week, what are they, what is their purpose, and how do they work? When might they slip up a bit here and there? We'll have a set of criteria for what makes a good eco-label, tons of examples with an exciting in-class activity involving a bunch of garbage, actually a bunch of packaging, but it'll seem like garbage, and some things to eat, uh, organic and fair trade certified, I assure you. Uh, I'll just foreshadow that for Reflection 8, uh, not only could you just focus on the material in class, you might uh, think about analyzing an individual product that you find out there in the retail wild. And I want you to understand what it means to follow the frog. Not telling you to do it, I want you to understand. So this week's basic idea, a market-based solution, right? We're talking about consumers. So we have a series of major problems linked to consumption. We've spent a little bit of time on those. But consumers claim to care. They often seem to care. So we should examine the market-based fixes that are out there, and specifically eco-labels. But we'll want to think critically about that. But it is that series of items, that logic that leads to the notion of eco-labels as a potential tool for change. So how do eco-labels work? Simple version, people care. So when products show up that have true claims uh, that match what people care about, people buy those products and thereby support the solutions. So there might be a little bit more to this, so let's step through it. So you have better environmental and social performance. We'll spend a little bit of time on what we mean by better, but assuming it's solving some of these big problems. And then there are consumer-facing claims about that performance, claims, information, ways to connect with consumers. And as a result, consumers buy the products based on those claims that we are assuming for now are true. So that that's basically it. Those are the fewest steps that we can disaggregate this process into. It's the better performance upstream, that consumer decision downstream, and the mechanism in between that connects them. So this mechanism may exist and function, but we want to examine what makes it work and where it might break down. In no case do we want to take it for granted. So I will uh, draw this distinction between eco-labels versus mere claims. And this is what I'll want you to grasp. These are going to be two ends of the spectrum, and we might find ourself, ourselves uh, locating points in between. So just be prepared for that. So when I say eco-label, uh, I will mean some sort of certification. Sometimes people will say a mark or a certification mark. It will be a claim or set of claims based on a set of standards. Uh, there's typically some independent process for verifying performance, i.e. that the standard has been met. Usually, there's a distinctive proprietary way of making the claim in a consumer-facing setting. This is typically a logo or a word uh, or some combination thereof. And ideally, uh, this label meets certain principles. And we're going to look at these greener choices criteria in some detail. Uh, that will be a, essentially a standard for these standards. So that's at one end of the spectrum. At the other end, we have mere claims that are not eco-labels. No clear set of standards, no verification or certification, and probably not even what is called in the U.S. regulated commercial speech. We'll say more about that in class. But the basic idea is words you can't use, uh, you know, by law, you, you may not use unless you are doing certain things that uh, that, that speech then communicates. So two quick notes. In all cases, I want you to try to make the connection between the performance claim and solutions to major problems. In other words, these are not separate from the rest of the topics we've looked at in class. These are, you know, big pivot and state shift and, uh, you know, climate crisis uh, topics still. And also, uh, subtly, claims are not necessarily lies. And eco-labels, on the other hand, do not necessarily address important truths. So we'll want to uh, be able to assess the presence or absence of a mechanism that meets the criteria that we look at, but those aren't the only types of communication that will matter, uh, so we will want to think a little more deeply on that, at that as well. 
So eco-labels, uh, issues and examples you're on the hook for. Uh, you see all of this in the materials on Canvas. We have some general background. Uh, the Triple Pundit article, I think, nicely sums it up, and the Greener Choices framework starts to give us a way to assess things. Organic Rainforest Alliance and Forest Stewardship Council are the ones we'll look at that have some credibility, but also here and there, maybe some issues, more for some than others. And then natural, we'll want to talk uh, about why it is so problematic uh, and why it is ubiquitous. But of course, its ubiquity is part of what makes it problematic. And in all cases, I really hope you'll be able to explain the general appeal that a label makes to consumers, also the underlying rationale for it, and where applicable, uh, Greener Choices assessment of the label. In other words, uh, how well does it do? So the framework. Let me hop through it quickly, we'll talk more in class. Uh, we want uh, labels to be meaningful, and what they really mean is that there's a set of standards uh, that goes beyond the industry norm. Uh, we want them to be consistent. I'll just foreshadow here that we'll talk about B Corp, which is not an eco-label, and want to understand why it, it surely fails on consistency. It doesn't mean it isn't meaningful, but it may not, may not meet this criterion under Greener Choices. And uh, transparency, uh, which really relates to the guts of certification, you know, what's underneath uh, the label and uh, something about the organization itself. Similarly, independence will be about the relationships or absence of relationships that a certifying organization will have. And finally, public comment, which should make you think of GRI because it invokes the notion of getting input from multiple stakeholders. And I want you to see these things working in tandem, these five criteria working in tandem uh, to deliver uh, something that works over time, that remains meaningful and accountable uh, to the people who use it. Uh, I'll tack on another, I don't know if this really deserves to be considered an additional criterion, but I think it, I think it deserves some discussion. I call it danger of the false halo. And that just means that uh, people make certain claims, and sometimes they even have certifications that imply falsely a breadth or depth that is not uh, entirely true. And we'll take a look at some examples of that in class. So the, the versions of it, not won't go through examples here, but the versions of the false halo I want to call out are these two under the category of persuasion without meaning. Uh, I'll distinguish between stories and context and vibe and feel. I think you'll see what I mean when we look at examples of packaging. I think we've all seen this, experienced it, maybe even fallen victim to it. I would say that's the case for myself. Uh, virtue by association will be a distinct uh, version of false halo. Uh, but I'll want you to think about uh, you know, whether you think that, uh, that virtue by association is deserved or not. Uh, the meaning of it is, is going to be trickier. And I will want you to ask why these phenomena are dangerous. I really think this is, a, you know, this is not as obvious as it seems. It's a bummer when people say things that are misleading, but what does it mean more broadly for the marketplace? What other kinds of production and consumption become more difficult if you have these uh, diabolical phenomena taking place? So, to this diagram, let's talk about these assumptions, the, the assumptions that are necessary to make eco-labels work, as I've drawn this out here. So this first step uh, between better environmental and social performance and this mechanism of consumer-facing claims assumes two things. First, that better performance is clearly defined. In other words, that there are meaningful standards. And second, that uh, the claims are true. In other words, that there's some sort of solid certification process. So that's how you get from the first step to the second. To get from the second to the third, we assume another few things. First, that consumers receive and understand the information behind the eco-label, and also that they're not distracted by similar, less credible claims. Uh, in other words, the eco-labels can't be going head-to-head -head with things that are similar that aren't as meaningful. And by implication, I would say that this tells us uh, or, or uh, by implication, this asserts that consumers can discern when the earlier steps are not functioning. In other words, uh, 
we're relying at least to some extent on consumers' ability to make sure that we've gone from the first step to the second, uh, that those pieces related to standards and certification. And the Greener Choices criteria will give us a way to break down an individual eco-label and parse it in, uh, in some detail. Uh, so those are named there. Again, we'll, we'll walk through them, through them a little bit more in class. So I will, uh, as we get through this, want you to fill in the blanks here. I think this will be sort of annoying and obvious, but still kind of fun. Uh, I do want you to walk away with this summed up in your brains. I don't want it to be just a, a soup of different material. Uh, I want you to I want you to have a have a clear sense of exactly what eco labels are trying to do. We will have an activity in class. We will eat some chocolate and examine the labels. I will try to have a wide variety of high quality chocolates so people aren't pinned down to other people's tastes. Uh, we will look at a handful of different labels, not just chocolate, a whole bunch of different labels. Look at the greener choices criteria and look at these other phenomena that I mentioned. And I'll have a few general questions that I'll hope you'll ask, and really about all certifications. Let me just mention a couple here. How much does the success of a of sustainable business depend on the consumer? I think this is really the highest level question that we're asking here. Uh, I, I think we assume that the market, that the consumer market, will reward certain performance. And I want us to pick away at that assumption a little bit. What are the tools for businesses to use to connect to consumers when they care and the big challenges that the business addresses? I think you can ask this about an individual business and about whole sectors. And we'll want to understand whether we think those mechanisms really work. Uh, You'll see here in the penultimate sub-bullet, uh, what are we asking of consumers? I mean, I will wonder out loud in some detail whether we are asking too much, and I'll want to hear your thoughts on that. And finally, uh, what sort of new industrial ecology do these labels create? And I mean that both literally and metaphorically uh, from the, the versions of that term that we had earlier in the course. This seems to be creating a parallel production system parallel production and consumption ecosystem uh, for certain products. And I want to hear what you think about that. So there are some important points of integration here worth calling out. Uh, we're going to uh, look at, uh, at those briefly, but this is also great fodder for uh, your reflections. And uh, we'll look ahead to uh, some of the other themes coming soon. Uh, Rainforest Alliance will be one of the eco-labels that we'll spend a little bit of time with. Let me say a few things about it here and we'll cover it in greater detail in class. Uh, I want you to try to decide, is this the environment or is this about people? Uh, and then also, as we look at their uh, amazing three-minute video uh, about, uh, titled Follow the Frog, I, I want you to really understand what it means and uh, you know, it can seem both awesome and dangerous, and I'll want us to wrestle with both pieces of that. Uh, there is a critique out there, and I want you to take a look at it. Uh, you don't have to dig around for more critique or an update, but I just want us to understand that these systems, even when they seem pretty darn good, uh, are never going to be flawless. They're going to have problems over time, and we'll want to see an example of that and ask whether you know, that's a fatal flaw or if it's just uh, you know, part of the cost of doing business and we need to have good ways to react. Uh, and again, for Rainforest Alliance, as for the other, uh, other ones we look at, I want you to come back to these general questions and, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll spend some time with the Rainforest Alliance details. Uh, we will also take a look at the Forest Stewardship Council. Uh, and I think it'll be pretty obvious that this is related to big problems mentioned in State Shift uh, and elsewhere. Uh, I will point out that FSC is the biggest solution uh, to, this, uh, to these problems uh, that's out there. It's by far the largest forest certification in the world. So we'll want to take it seriously and try to understand uh, its structure a little bit. You got a little bit in the materials, but I'll say more in class. And I'll point out not just that it's become big, but that it also has some problems. 
and we'll look at some uh, critiques, uh, some critiques with very different tone from Greenpeace and FSC Watch, uh, fun organizations to take a look at. Again, the goal is to understand strengths and weaknesses, not just to dump it, uh, if it at the first sight of some problems. I think that's a challenge, but that's what we'll do. So uh, on FSC, I want to make sure that we distinguish uh, between these different uh, certifications, these different flavors of FSC uh, labeling that you'll see out there in the real world. Uh, we'll walk through the different criteria. Uh, some of these we'll spend a little bit more time on than others, and then we'll look at those critiques uh, from Greenpeace and FSC Watch. Uh, I didn't mention it here, but we will, of course, look in detail at organic certification. You see that in the reading materials. That is it uh, for uh, this pre-lecture. Thank you. See you in class.